Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society, and I want to welcome you to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry to audiences right around the world. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to a man who was a student at Henry Nouwen's at Yale and who then went on to become a professor who has over the years taught many students about the spirituality of Henry Nouwen. Dr. Michael Christensen is my guest today, and he's published 11 books, including The Heart of Henry Nouwen and the famous Nouwen trilogy, Spiritual Direction, Spiritual Formation and Discernment by Henry J.M. Nouwen with Michael Christensen and Rebecca J. Laird. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today for this podcast. Tell me a little bit um, about you and your relationship to Henry Nouwen. You studied with Henry Nouwen at Yale Divinity School in the early 1980s. What courses did you take with him and uh, what was he like as a teacher? Well, I met him as a student, of course, and I took a course from him every semester that I was at Yale. It didn't matter what he was teaching, whether it was a course called Hesychasm or Spiritual Formation. It didn't matter what it was called. I wanted to learn from from Henry, and he was quite popular there uh, at the time in the 80s, and he'd been there all through the 70s. He had more or less a, a group that followed him around everywhere, and his classes were about 100 people per class. And I was the one that followed him from afar. You know how the scripture says, uh, you know, Nathaniel followed Jesus from afar. <laughs> I followed I followed Henry from afar, and but learned from him really at his feet, um, in, metaphorically, in every class I took. Were you also part of those Quite gatherings a, that happened, um, you know, outside of a class? I think he was, he had a gift of hospitality. Did you get to come to any of those kind of events with Henry? I, I did. I, I went on Tuesday nights, <clears throat> I went on Tuesday nights to his house, or it could have been Monday nights. I can't remember now. Monday or Tuesday nights, he would gather those who wanted to pray the Psalms with him. So he would have a nice, hospitable um, time near the near the Divinity School, near the campus. He'd have wine and cheese out, and would have fellowship and time together. And then he'd gather us in a circle, pass out the singing Psalms version that he got from the Trappists, and we would spend. Um, a good half hour just praying the psalms and having a, a closing evening prayer together. So I, I participated in that, and also his daily mass. He, you know, I was Nazarene evangelical, and he was Roman Catholic, of course. But he had an inclusive community and and communion, and so I was invited to into the circle, as many Protestants at Yale were. And we simply, um, I, I learned, I memorized the, the Eucharist by attending those daily masses at 530 in the basement of the Divinity School. So, yeah, I, I took advantage of every opportunity to be with him and learn from him. And he took an interest in me probably because of my evangelical background, and he probably saw that I was struggling a bit in this so-called liberal seminary, and he took me under his wings and encouraged me to, to be who I was, to claim my roots, bless my source, and and develop spiritually that, in that inclusive, community. That inclusiveness uh, is, is a very beautiful, very significant aspect of Henry. Now, I'm curious about one thing you said. You said there was a course, was it Hezekiah, or what, what was that course? It was an odd word to me, and I don't know it. Tell me what that was. Hezekasm. Hezekasm. What so, does that mean? Hezekasm. Well, it's a Greek. It's a Greek word for uh, with the root of Hezekiah, which means peace and repose of the soul, and it was practiced through contemplation and praying the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner, repetitively, and those who followed that prayer form back to Mount Athos in Greece, and then the Russian uh, pilgrims, they were called Hezekiah. And so this course was focused on the Hezekasts who practice Hezekiah, peace and repose. So Hezekasm is the practice of, of finding the peace and repose within you through contemplative prayer and, and repeating the Jesus prayer. And that, that course then evolved into his book, 
on desert spirituality called the way of the heart. Oh, that's lovely. Now, you and your wife, Rebecca Laird, developed three posthumous books by now and on spiritual direction, spiritual formation, and discernment. What was that process like? Where did you draw the material from? And how did you put it together as a seamless whole rather than a kind of anthology of selected writings? Well, of course, since I took his courses, I took a course from Henry Nowen on spiritual direction. I took a course from him on spiritual formation. And long after, you know, a few years, I guess, after he died, I wanted to continue promoting his legacy. And I noted in all his 40 books that he never wrote a book about spiritual direction. And so that became the first book in the in the trilogy that we wanted to that I wanted to do. And Rebecca, who's a background as an editor, is has this gift of weaving things together into a coherent whole. And so we 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 got a contract and permission from the now and estate uh, to to knit together not an anthology but a but a full seamless book that was based on his course called Spiritual Direction. So I. I had, you know, at the archives, I had access to his class lecture notes and his notebook of, you know, preparation for the course. And I had access to my own notes that I took while experiencing spiritual direction. So we knitted that together and then brought in strands from unpublished articles or manuscripts, sermons, uh, journal entries, and were able to knit together an experience of spiritual direction that he offered his students in class. And uh, that's the origin of that first book. I know that these books are incredibly popular, particularly I I find a lot of uh, courses that are being offered. We'll have them on the, on the list of readings. How about spiritual formation? That's the one we're going to focus on today. Tell me a little bit about the history of that. Um, I, I, uh, I think all three books are incredibly rich treasures, and I really want to encourage our audience to consider these three books. But tell me a little bit about the history of spiritual formation. And that's actually my favorite of the three volumes we've done. Spiritual Direction is the most popular, you know, has sold the most copies. People find it very helpful. And Spiritual Formation has, has lagged behind a bit in the, among the other two. But for me, it's my favorite because it is Henry as psychologist priest. You know, he called himself a hyphenated priest, a priest-psychologist. And this book on formation really features his, his field of, spiritu- of spirituality, which for him is the intersection of theology, study of God, and psychology, study of the soul or psyche, and where the psyche and, and, and God theology come together is this network called spirituality. So this features that intersection. And the material is drawn both from his course on spiritual formation, again, which I took, and it's drawn from various writings, both published and unpublished, on the movements of the spiritual life. So when I noted in reading, you know, the the, the canon of Henry Nouwen, when I noted all the, you know, the recurring pattern of movements of the heart, you know, from this quality to that quality, from fear to love, from hostility to hospitality, from loneliness to aloneness with God. I, I noted he keeps writing in every book about one movement or another, and so I counted them, and I counted 27 movements from this to that that Henry Nouwen wrote about. And so this book then was organized around, well, let's choose the seven, or seven, uh, let's choose seven of these 27 movements that seem to be the most helpful to people and the most, uh, that he writes about the most, things like from resentment to gratitude, um, fear to love. Um, denying death to befriending death. And so we took seven movements of the 27 and then built the book around it, both from his class notes and lecture notes and mine, as well as from his published writings and unpublished writings and that we knit together. I think a beautiful book that is vintage Henry in, in, as psychologist, 
as pre-psychologist, which is where he really excelled. Oh, I, th- I think that describes it well. It is vintage, and it is, it's a beautiful book. It's, I really would encourage people to pick this up. It's interesting, in the timing of the year, we hope to start out this year in terms of our podcast, with this being the month of January, and thinking very much really about, um, in a sense, how do we do well? this Christian life? How do we deepen it? How do we stay the course? And I think this spiritual formation book would be something that would be worth taking a look at and and using in a way as a tool to deepen your spiritual life. Tell me a little bit more about how this can, in a sense, be used either by a group or individually or in a class. Well, because the, the book features Visio Divina, uh, you know, ga- gazing at sacred images in comparison to Lectio Divina, uh, you know, reading sacred texts. I think it's really helpful uh, for people to, to to get out of their, you know, left side of the brain and into the right side that accesses images and, and, and deals with the material in a different way. Each chapter has an image, an icon, an iconographic image, or a you know, piece of sacred art, or Rembrandt, you know, and, and these images for Henry are aids to prayer. So when we, when we gaze at an image, says Henry, when we pray with an icon, we are invited into that story, into that spiritual place. We look for the window or the door, the icon that opens to us, and we enter into it in our prayer life, into this space where the Spirit of God is present. So because it takes that practice as the featured practice in the book, I think it's, well, I know it's been very helpful to my students and very helpful to many students who read this as a group or who read it individually, devotionally for their own spiritual life. It allows you to enter very directly in the presence of God. And then once you do that, this book helps you go into your heart, letting your mind descend into your heart. And there in your heart, you find what Henry calls polarities, you know, anguish, maybe depression, and as well as joy, and, and, and all these polarities that are sometimes opposites to each other. And then through spiritual practice, let's say praying with an icon, you're able to move from one polarity to the other. Let's say you're feeling resentful, and you get in touch in your heart with a with a spirit of resentment and ask yourself or ask the Lord, help me move out of this toxic place of resentment into a place of, of gratitude. And then move, following that movement of the heart, uh, we are able to move from one condition to another spiritual condition, through spiritual practice, through prayer. And that's what the book really focuses on, and and each chapter is devoted to a particular theme, a particular polarity, and the movement out of the negative into the positive uh, uh, polarity, which is how we talk about the spiritual life. It's interesting to talk about uh, Visio Divina. Uh, My background is as an artist, and it means an awful lot to me to know that people are encouraged to look at art and draw from it something spiritual, something deeper, something bigger, or something that hits us at a very, very different level of our being. Um, It certainly is the way in which I respond, and uh, it can be, in a sense, like going to uh, a cathedral for me to go to an art gallery. I always find the Spirit speaks to me through the paintings that are there, and that's a very important part of my life. Let me ask you about one... as 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 it was for Henry, I mean... You know, there's a lot of Christians, particularly in my own background and tradition, who are kind of afraid of images or icons and, and are very textually oriented, word word oriented. And for me, this helps me get out of my head, more into my heart. And Henry, through his own actions and his own practice, helped me and helped many people sit before a painting, let's say a Rembrandt or a Van Gogh, and sit there long enough to, with the with your prophetic imagination, with your spiritual illumination, go into that image in your heart and be there, be right there. 
Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you've experienced that as well. It's a common thing for any of us who are now an enthusiast. Yeah, it means a lot to me. I, I guess one of the most central movements that you develop within your book is the one of From Fear to Love. Would you tell me a little bit more about that? You describe it here as the mother of all movements. <laughs> tell me a bit more about <laughs> what it is to go from fear to love, what Henry understood and what he wanted to give us in that. Yeah, yeah. I often when I teach the the movements, <clears throat> I teach at least seven, and sometimes I go, I, you know, I add to those movements. But when I get to that movement from fear to love, I always tell my students now, we're about to talk about the mother of all movements, this great movement from fear to love, because Henry really focused in his writings and in his life and in his spiritual direction he offered to others that the core movement in our heart is how do we move from the house of fear into the house of love? How do we move out of the house that fear built around us and traps us and prisons us into the house that love built? And I think for Henry and for me and many of us, fear is that core uh, paralyzing condition. Think about all the things that we do in our actions and behavior that, you know, at the root of them, they're based on fear. Yeah, that's why the angels in Scripture always their first words out of their mouth to the faithful was "Fear not." Yeah, and and the Lord is always telling us, "Fear not, for I am with thee. I've called you by name." Because we're very fearful people. And Henry wrote many books about how fear can paralyze and be pervasive, but he also offered a way out of fear, because he says he quotes John, "Perfect love casts out fear." So how does perfect love, the love, the house that love built, how does that cast out fear? And again, it's through uh, first naming that demon, that dragon, fear, and name, giving it a name, what makes me afraid, what paralyzes me, and then gazing on the house of love, which for Henry was Rublev, Rublev's uh, famous icon of the Old Testament trinity, the three figures form a perfect circle of love and we are invited to join them in that circle at that at that altar and that's just a beautiful um, icon of of the house that love built and then he tells the story which is a lovely story about how the the monks in russia back i think in the 14th century their monastery was uh was being attacked by enemies violently and the monks inside were afraid and they were so afraid of the outward attacks and violence warfare that it interfered with it it interfered with their contemplative prayer and so the the, the um the monastery abbot, abbot the abbot of the monastery uh, called his iconographer rublev in to paint us a picture write us an icon that would help us focus not in our fear but on your great love oh lord and so rublev then as the story goes painted this beautiful icon that became a masterpiece and when the monks focused their prayers through that icon they were no longer afraid they were able to not be distracted and keep their eyes on god so that's that's henry's story that he focuses on when he himself was afraid how he could name that fear and then move through prayer right into the house that love built and stay there as long as you can because you can't you know you can live there in your heart but you know we're all we all get distracted and we get back into our fear and so the spiritual life is a constant coming into the presence of god and when we when we leave or get distracted we again are called back and so that movement back and forth is how he understood the spiritual life we don't get in once and for all. We keep coming back into the presence of God through daily practice. And that's a beautiful way to look at the spiritual life, I think. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, you know, I, I think as I talk to you, uh, you had that privilege of being a student of Henry's and a friend. I know that you and Rebecca were friends with Henry. And that's a very important aspect of your relationship as well. But it's been almost, it's been 24 years since Henry died. And I'm curious about some of these, you know, we lay down planks, we lay down a road 
that becomes deeper and deeper in us. I, I'm curious about how Henry influenced your daily spiritual life. Is Are there ways in which you have held on to routines or ways of, of meditating? Or is there anything that you can say to us has remained a kind of um, element of your life that you don't let go of? I'm curious, Michael. Yeah, even after 24 years, for sure. And then, I, of course, I followed him after I left uh, the new school. So it's been, you know, since 1980 uh, that I had at, at seminary a conversion within my own conversion. So as I told you, I was raised in, in the evangelical tradition where we tended to have verbal prayer and devotions, and we read our Bible to have Bible study and learn the scriptures and and, and experienced discipleship that was very cognitive and, and, and verbally based. When I met Henry in, in course and learned from him, I discovered uh, the liturgical year and how we can get ourselves in the rhythm of, you know, it's Christmas time, Christ is being born in me, not just remembering back when Christ was born in Bethlehem. And when it's Epiphany, Christ is being revealed in me and in the church. And then, you know, Lent. Uh, we're, we're preparing for uh, for Easter, and so we deny ourselves and follow Jesus into the desert. And then at Easter, our Holy Week, we're we're dealing with the Passion of Christ, and praise and passion. And then Easter, the resurrection of Christ within ourselves. And then Pentecost, the giving the gift of the Spirit. And if we and if I found that if I can pair what's happening in me, my story, with His story. Christ story that the church rehearses and enacts every year in a rhythm, an annual rhythm, that connects me uh, to God in a very beautiful, beautiful way. And that was brand new for me. I had not been a liturgically oriented uh, Christian. And that's a practice I've, that has stayed with me ever since, you know, since 1980. I, I have followed the church year in its prayers and its themes and its high and holy days. That's one. A second practice is contemplation. Again, we had our quiet time as a, as, a, as a Sunday school kid or as a youth in the church, but sustained silence, like this morning. I got up at 6 a.m. Uh, before the sun rose at 6.30, and I had a full half hour this very morning to gaze out my window and wait for the sun to rise, and then very consciously and with intentionality connect the sunrise with the Son of God, and it aided my prayer. Just seeing the light slowly dawn, it aided my prayer life uh, for a full half hour today. I can't always spend a half hour in prayer. Henry spent an hour every morning in prayer. He's very disciplined. But I do what I can, and the pattern is um, what I learned from Henry, where he taught us in class that Jesus got up early in the morning, went off to a lonely place, usually a mountain, sometimes a lake, and there he prayed. I love that verse of Mark, Gospel of Mark. Jesus rose early in the morning, went off to a lonely place, a place of solitude, and there he prayed. And then he went down the mountain and gathered with his disciples and did, you know, had communion, community with them. And then together they went out to the world to do mission, ministry, compassion. And that rhythm of starting with solitary prayer Embracing your community of faith and then going out in ministry is a rhythm that Henry lived and taught and that I try to uh, seek to um, continue that pattern in my own life. Oh, Those are just a few. I also pray with icons. And there's a lot of practices that I, I've mm -hmm. held on to over the years. That's lovely, Michael. Michael, in the appendix of uh, Spiritual Formation, you write about Nouwen's place in spiritual development theory. What was his contribution to stage theories and the field of adult spiritual development? Well, that's a that's a great that's a great question. I, I uh, in the book I devoted an appendix, uh, an addendum, uh, which is my my take on his contribution to adult spiritual formation. You know, he he taught at Harvard, and at Harvard University over the years, there's there's all these great stage theorists in in. Um, human growth and development, you know, from, you know, Piaget and Kohlberg and Eric Erickson and all these great uh, writers in psychology. 
that apply stages of development <clears throat> to uh, maturity, to human growth and development and maturity. And Henry was, as a psychologist, was certainly aware and learned from the stage theorists, beginning probably with Piaget and cognitive development in, in psychology. But, you know, Erickson has these eight stages, and Lawrence Kohlberg has these seven stages of moral development. And, um, so he was tempted to go that route, especially being being brought up and nurtured in Roman Catholic faith. You, you're used to these, you know, three stages of spiritual development, you know, um, uh, what is it, uh, purgation, illumination, um, oh, i to read my notes for three stages. It became five stages, and then Teresa of Avila has seven stages of development. Uh, John, John Climacus uh, in the 6th century talked about Jacob's ladder and said there are 667 rungs on this ladder as we ascend to God and to perfection. So Henry was steeped in that spiritual tradition of stages and steps, as well as psychology and its stage theories. And when he studied that and tried to live it, he, he fell into a kind of despair that he could not continue climbing the ladder, as if the spiritual life was cumulative and progressive and you didn't lose any ground. And so when he, when he concluded, I think at Notre Dame, as early as Notre Dame, uh, at least by Yale, he concluded that he couldn't keep climbing the ladder of progressive steps and stages to unitive consciousness with Christ, that that uni unity was something that you experienced in the moment and then, you know, you, you, you left it and you keep coming back to it. So he developed a quite unique approach to the spiritual life and to spiritual development, which, as I said, these movements of the heart back and forth vacillating, if you will, between this pole and that pole, hostility to, him, to hospitality, let's say, or resentment to gratitude. And so his contribution to adult spiritual development uh, is to see not stages so much as if, where am I now on the spiritual journey? How far have I advanced? Am I further along than when I first believed? Have I reached enlightenment yet? He says that's not a productive way to look and to, to explore your own spiritual life. It's better to say, where am I now in this present moment, and where would I like to be, God helping me? So his contribution is looking at the movements. It, it's as if he took Jacob's ladder of ascent and put it on its side and said, the ladder is on the ground, and we move back and forth horizontally more than vertically on the ladder of divine ascent. Oh, that's fascinating. So he, he, tweaked, he tweaked the tradition. He, yeah. he reconstructed the tradition. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, I think your book, Spiritual Formation, is a primer on how to live a spiritual life. It, it's a book that really looks at the movement from the mind to the heart and how to live in the center, the place where God dwells. And I, I'm so grateful that you and Rebecca have done these three wonderful books. Before I let you go, I'm so grateful. I, I, I really want to encourage people. Go to our website. You can find there amongst book resources these three books. Uh, particularly, we're talking today about spiritual formation, and you can order it there. Um, it will take you probably to Amazon or to, or to Harper One, who published this book. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, another question, a, a different question. You are a teacher. You taught it. Uh, you were a professor at Drew. I know you continue to be a professor. And I was just wondering, are there places online that people could go and take a course from you on Henry Nouwen? Uh, is there anything you would recommend? Well, you know, thank, thank you for asking that because I do teach at different institutions and I do, my, one of my signature courses is Spiritual Formation with Henry Nouwen. But most of these courses I teach are for the students at that particular institution. Like this semester, I'm teaching at Nazarene Theological Seminary, a course on Henry Nouwen, and I teach for the Episcopal School, you know, a similar course. But if if you're not enrolled in a seminary or a theological school or a college or university that teaches a Henry Nouwen course, there is a way to access uh, my courses through Northwind. 
uh, seminary. It's a new it's a it's a new seminary that's purely and totally online, uh, globally accessible, and it's northwindseminary.org. And if you go to northwindseminary.org, either for credit or for continuing education, you can enroll in a certificate program in spiritual formation using these books and other Henry Nowen books, The Life and Works of Henry Nowen, and enroll in one, two, or three courses there where I have video lectures and then I have a Zoom or a video conferencing uh, conversation with students through Northwind. So I, I, I hope some will, uh, will go there and enroll in the certificate program in spiritual formation or a particular or just one course. First course, spiritual direction. Second course, spiritual formation. Third course, discernment, how to read the signs of daily life. And that would constitute a way to get uh, access to uh, exploring the contemplative spiritual tradition through the lens and through the heart of Henry Nowen. Oh, that, that is great. We'll make sure all those details are on the website. So as you're listening to this podcast, we invite you to go back to the website and you'll you'll get details about Michael Christensen's courses and how to uh, connect with Northwind. Um, I want to give you a little heads up. This is the first time I've announced it in any of our podcasts. We are planning the 25th anniversary conference. It's going to be at St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. June 24th to 26th in 2021. So those of you who are listening and are interested in being part of this very special gathering, mark your calendars now and plan to join us then. And we're hoping that we can bring Professor uh, Michael Christensen to do a course the week before that you might either take to to uh, for credit at uh, either at uh, the Toronto School of Theology or at uh, St. Michael's College School of Theology or you may just be able to sit in on it and enjoy it. We, we, these are some of our dream plans at this stage, but you'll be hearing about this and we will certainly be reaching out to all of you who are listening. Michael, I want to thank you for this interview and I want to encourage everyone, this book, Spiritual Formation, is well worth getting and it's one you can do either individually or you can do in a group. And it's something that I think you'll, you'll find be, will be a valuable tool as you set out in this new year to deepen your spiritual walk, deepen your relationship with the one who holds you at the core of your being. Thank you, Michael, for being with us today. And thank you, Karen, for, for uh, embodying uh, the spirituality in me now. And I, I find that inspirational as well. And it's always a pleasure to talk with you. I hope you came away from this interview with Michael Christensen as inspired as I was. Michael shared wonderful memories of Henry, and Michael also gives us all good reason to dive into the now and book, Spiritual Formation. If you did enjoy this podcast, we'd be so grateful if you'd take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up, and please share it with your friends and family. As well, you'll find links in the show notes for our website and any content, resources, or books discussed in this interview with Michael Christensen. Thank you again for listening. Until next time.